This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Genetic testing has become increasingly popular, but after getting your results back from companies like Ancestry or 23andMe, are you satisfied with the information about your distant relatives? Or does it leave you wanting more? Today, where we live, do we really understand heredity? It's the focus of Carl Zimmer's new book, She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. What do we inherit from inherit from our relatives beyond genes? We're going to take a closer look this hour, and we want to hear from you, too. You can join the conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Right now, we are again at our uh, studios in New Haven at Gateway Community College. And so I want to welcome into our studio Carl Zimmer, a New York Times columnist and author of more than a dozen books, including this new one we're going to talk about this hour. Carl, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So this entire book is uh, over 600 pages, and it, it focuses on this idea of heredity. When we talk about heredity, what are we talking about exactly? It's funny because heredity is one of these words that uh, you don't need to define it for anybody. You know, as a science writer, sometimes I'm defining words like meiosis or things like that. But heredity, people got it. But when you ask people what it is, it's almost a little magical. You'll say like, well, it's the reason that I'm starting to sound like my father now that I'm getting into my 50s, you know, and that there are these these connections that we have with the past or when we look at our kids, we see something of ourselves and them. And we're not really sure how it happened, but we feel those bonds. And so in this book, I wanted to explore uh, some of the stories of heredity and what science can help us understand about it. We were talking right before the show about um, what circumstances lead us to ask these questions. And often it's when uh, we if we decide to have children, when we're at the uh, the obstetrician and maybe they recommend going to a genetics counselor. That actually happened to you and your wife. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I have uh, two teenage girls. And when my wife was pregnant with our first child, Charlotte, we went to a genetics counselor because our doctor said we should do it. And I kind of waltzed in there thinking, oh, this is everything I already know already because I write about this stuff for a living. And I was very snotty. And (laughs) uh, (laughs) but, you know, as this counselor was just explaining to me some of the basics and asking me questions about my own family history, I kind of panicked because I realized that I didn't really understand my family history very well. I mean, people, you know, had died of various causes I wasn't really clear about. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh my gosh, but wait a minute, like maybe I am carrying some of these genes and have passed them down to my child who I haven't met yet. And I suddenly felt this responsibility uh, for it and and felt completely out of my depth. And and I think that was for me when it really hit me just how powerful heredity can be in our lives. So when we think about heredity, it's and when we read this book especially, it's more than just that link to our biological link to like the past and the future. That's something that you explain throughout the book. You actually go way back into when uh, people first started thinking about heredity, when they thought about our links uh, to our parents. I mean, what were some of the common notions out there? Well, the way we talk about heredity, honestly, is is a pretty recent thing in history. I mean, if you go back to say, ancient Greeks or ancient Romans, they just don't use our language uh, in the way we do. They don't talk about parents having some microscopic substance that uh, gets passed down to us and then sort of encodes who we are. It just It's not in their thinking at all. You know, the word heredity comes from a Latin word hereditas, which meant uh, had to do more with inheritance of you know, stuff, you know, houses, uh, money, things like that. You know, they would talk about, well, why is it that uh, people just always grow up to, to look similar? Well, they sort of th- sometimes they would say, well, it's kind of like you think of it like cheese, you know, like you take some milk and you add in some culture and under the same environmental conditions, you get cheese. Like, why is this a big surprise? And so it's really only in the 17 and 1800s that the thinking starts to shift to the way we think about it. So they were thinking about bloodlines at the time? Right. So if you look at how people talk about blood, you know, that really is is sort of the emerging idea about heredity, that there's this continuity between the generations that has to do with some sort of like biological substance. And, uh, you know, and of course, this this is uh, immediately like uh, turned into like noble blood or low blood. And, and, you know, and it becomes a way of sort of justifying 
power, basically, like that I have no, I have inherited noble blood. I am a noble person. Therefore, I get all this stuff. <laughs> and so genealogy actually comes out of that, where noble families would draw trees to prove that they deserve to inherit all this power. Uh, and in places like Spain, the concept of race starts to get mixed into that because Jews are described as a separate race. And now there in Spain, in the 1500s, genealogists are trying to prove that these noble families don't have any Jews in their background because that would be devastating because that meant you were not of pure old Christian blood, as they called it. But there were consequences uh, to that thinking, making sure that you kept uh, uh, this bloodline pure by marrying your relatives. You uh, talk about the Habsburg. Tell us more about them and and the circumstances that led to all that inbreeding. Yeah, I mean, this is just one of these incredible stories that uh, really illuminates heredity and and, and the, the strange ironies of it. Um, you have the Habsburg dynasty, uh, which is arguably the most powerful uh, family in, in maybe in the whole history of Europe. You know, they, they control in the 1500s and into the 1600s, they're controlling much of Europe, much of the New World. Um, you know, sh- ships laden with silver are coming in you know, all the time. They're just, they have more money than they know, know what to do with. And the family wants to keep the inheritance of all of that within the dynasty. And so um, they don't just marry anybody. They marry relatives, like really close relatives, (laughs) like uncles marry nieces, for example. Um, And for some reason that they don't understand, uh, over the years they start having trouble having children. And and when they do have children, the children uh, often die very young. And everyone is suspecting witchcraft and there are witch trials and, and there's this, this ongoing desperation. And finally, you know, the one last king um, at, at the end of the 1600s just fails to have any issue at all. And the whole dynasty just basically collapses. And, and what was happening was heredity. In other words, they were, because they were so becoming so inbred, they were passing down a lot of disease-causing genes and they just kept accumulating more and more and they weren't getting any uh, other genes to sort of compensate for that. And so they just devastated themselves trying to protect their inheritance. There was even a, a facial characteristic that they had because of that inbreeding, the Habsburg jaw. The Habsburg it? jaw, yeah. So so the suspicion is that um, they, one of the genes they started passing down affected the development of their face. So actually the upper jaw failed to develop fully and so the lower jaw seemed to jut out so far that basically the mouth kind of hung open and you could recognize the Habsburg's kings from this jaw. I mean it's like literally heredity looking you in the face. This is where we live. I'm speaking with science writer Carl Zimmer. He's a New York Times award-winning columnist, author of more than a dozen books. His most recent one is She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. We're broadcasting out of our New Haven studio, and I wanted uh, to give the number if you wanted to join the conversation. Uh, So many of us are interested in our family roots, and what does that mean when we get these uh, tests, uh, how it connects us to our biological past, but maybe even a little bit more um, as we learn about heredity today. When did scientists first start to think about heredity as the passing down of traits from the parent to the child, whether it was in a human or in an animal that might be breeding? Uh, it, you see little glimmers of it. Um, e- even <clears throat> in uh, even in the, actually in the 1500s, there's an essayist, Montaigne, who, who writes an essay uh, about his father um, because Montaigne is, is getting kidney stones which is making his life miserable. And it occurs to him his dad had kidney stones. And he says, wait a minute, like, did I get my kidney stones from my father? And he's like, how did this, how would that work? Because when I was born, he didn't have kidney stones. So, so you know, and he, he's puzzling over that. And you're looking at it and you're like, you're so close to like, really like a modern thinking about heredity. But really it takes 300 years for it to really click in. Um, and part of it is... Um, Part of it is animal breeding and plant breeding. In, uh, in the 1700s, there's a, a sheep breeder who, who named Robert Bakewell in England who becomes internationally famous because he just creates an entirely new breed just in a matter of a few years by very carefully selecting individual sheep to breed. Uh, and everybody, including Charles Darwin, later on was just astonished. Like, how did he do it? What was the secret? And lots of people try to figure out what was the secret? What are the rules for breeding? 
and one of them was th- uh, this uh, was this germ- uh, this Central P- European monk named Gregor Mendel, who did some experiments on peas and got some very interesting results, which unfortunately were then probably pretty much ignored for decades to come. So it wasn't until the, the early 1900s that scientists rediscover his work and realize we're talking about genes and they start a new science, which they call genetics. You mentioned uh, Charles Darwin uh, just briefly. He's someone that was asking the question about how uh, we pass things on, but he didn't quite get it right. What was his theory? Yeah, I mean, Darwin uh, deserves a huge amount of credit uh, because he actually really explicitly framed heredity as a scientific question. Um, and it was start- that thinking was starting to emerge, but really Darwin deserves a lot of credit for saying, like, what is heredity? And he needed to know for his theory of evolution to really work. Um, and he, so he would do all sorts of research on you know, animal breeders like, like Bakewell. He was very interested in uh, psycho- the early psychologists, the alienists, who were uh, arguing that insanity seemed to run in families. And he was wondering, how did that work? Um, but he had this idea, maybe our s- cells are full of little particles, all of our cells. And somehow these particles could stream down into the eggs and sperm And then when the eggs and sperm combined, those particles combined, and that produced a person that had a mixture of the traits of their parents. Um, It's brilliant, but totally wrong. (laughs) And, you know, that's okay for Darwin to be wrong. Um, His cousin, Francis Galton, was really excited about this and said, oh, I know we can do an experiment to prove you're right. We'll take some rabbits of different colors and we'll inject the blood of one rabbit into the other rabbit and see if that rabbit has babies that match in color the donor rabbit. Totally failed. Um, And uh, so basically Darwin kind of went quiet with his theory and that was the end of it. And you mentioned this monk, uh, Mendel. He actually figured out a little bit about how our cells carry these uh, these genes, and that's how we pass on our DNA to uh, to our offspring. Uh, But you said that it was ignored. Why? I don't think anybody in the 1850s, including Mendel, could make sense of what he had discovered. Um, uh, you know, he, he was discovering, for example, that you know, he, he could take peas that had uh, pea plants that made smooth peas and pea plants that made wrinkled peas and made them, and then the next generation was all smooth. And then if he mated those hybrids together, a quarter of the next generation was wrinkled again. So there was a what you could call a factor that for wrinkled peas that was in the plants and it was passed down even if you couldn't see the wrinkles, you know, so there was this invisible process. And, but nobody knew really much about what was inside of cells yet. You know, nobody really knew about chromosomes and things like that. So Mendel would look at these results and be like, well, there's something almost mathematical going on here, but I can't really tell you what it is. Uh, once uh, scientists uh, were able to grasp this uh, language of genes uh, and genetics, how was that? You have this really interesting uh, story about how, um, and we would all have heard of eugenics, but how that was then uh, warped in a way to think about how you could literally um, try to have a one particular race of people um, and how that would be easy to do and by getting rid of another type of person who was considered uh, undesirable. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the Vineland training school and that story there. Sure. So the the Violent Training School was founded in uh, the late 1800s by um, people who wanted to provide better care for what they would call the feeble-minded. Um, you know, today you might uh, refer to, to these people as developmentally disabled. Um, but in any case, it was a very humane place. You know, they, they built very clean cottages and they actually taught the taught children there. They weren't warehoused. Um, and but uh, in 1906, a psychologist comes there named Henry Goddard, and he wants to study the intelligence of the children. And um, he starts giving them the intelligence tests, the earliest intelligence tests given in the United States. Uh, and then he discovers genetics, and he suddenly decides that uh, that they must be inheriting their feeble-mindedness from their ancestors. Um, and there's this idea, this concept called eugenics that's been around since the 1880s. Francis Galton actually coins the term, basically saying, well, if intelligence is inherited, then we should breed our own species the way we breed sheep. So you encourage all those intelligent people to have kids. That's what Galton would say. And he th- 
claim we could create a galaxy of genius. Um, in the United States, um, it takes a much darker turn. Instead, the it gets flipped to say we need to prevent people with what we judge to be you know unfit uh, characteristics to have kids. Um, and so Henry Goddard, um, based on the kids there uh, th- that he studies, uh, he starts to lobby for sterilization laws, basically that the state can sterilize people deemed uh, unfit because we don't want them passing on those genes to next generations. Um, you know, it's a real tragic story. I focus on one woman that he studied in particular who was institutionalized for her whole life for no good reason. Um, and, uh, you know, and it, it's, I think it's a real lesson in um, how dangerous it is to use a simplistic understanding of heredity to justify pre-existing biases and put social policy in a terrible direction. Um, because you can see that, you know, the Nazis come into power and they really like Henry Goddard's work. They mm-hmm. quote him extensively to justify exterminating people. So they they were thinking that there was a relationship between intelligence and genetics, but they didn't quite have the science right. And the sterilization laws we saw uh, that happened in many states in our country, even though we often think about uh, what the Nazis did because they used extermination for people they thought were undesirable. Uh, but when we look at what happened at violence school and how that um I guess, encouraged that thinking. Uh, you mentioned this this uh, girl who became the focus, uh, Emma. She essentially was just an orphan. Yeah, so th- there was this one girl that Henry Goddard focused a lot on named Emma Wolverton, and she was basically sent to the violent training school because she was inconvenient. <clears throat> her mother was going to get remarried, and the her fiancé said, that's fine, but you got to get rid of your children. So she ends up in, in this institution, and uh, and uh, Henry Goddard gives her this test, and he judges that she is some slightly le- scoring slightly less than average, and he needs a name for people like her. You know, they're not. You know, they would use names like idiots and imbeciles. These were like sort of clinical terms at the time. But she, he needs a term for her, and he coins a new word, moron. So that so you know Henry Goddard is 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 the person who gave us that that term and um, you know by identifying her as a moron and then going and doing genealogical research on her past he 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 claims to have all this evidence that she inherited some mysterious gene for feeble mindedness and um, so she gets transferred out of the violent training school across the street to a place for feeble minded women and spends the rest of her life there. I mean, she does all sorts of things. She produces plays. She takes care of children. She, she teaches herself carpentry. Like, this is a very capable woman. And yet she was trapped until she died in, in uh, the 1970s, uh, in her 80s. And, you know, and and the outcome, as you mentioned, is also that you have thousands of Americans who were sterilized um, for decades. For some of these laws, only got taken down relatively recently. What do we know of what science tells us today about the link between intelligence and our genes? So uh, we we have many uh, thousands uh, of genes. Uh, this idea that. Um, Having a certain particular gene, maybe it could uh, increase our IQ by a few points. But what about the interplay between uh, nurture and nature? Yeah, so the <clears throat> the big problem with uh, Henry Goddard was that he had this very simple thinking that you you could trace a really complicated part of our existence down to one gene. Um, and the fact is that, in general, um, our traits are influenced by many, many genes, even as something as simple as height, which I write about in the book. There are thousands of genes that influence how tall you are, um, and you inherit those from, from your parents, but you can't point to any one of them and say, this is why I'm tall. Um, so there's, it's even less possible for you to point to one gene and say, this is why I'm smart. Uh, it just doesn't <laughs> some work. Some people do that. <laughs> some people do, and they are wrong. Um, and yeah, so so there are lots of genes that each influence uh, intelligence test scores in incredibly subtle ways, on average. Um, and and yet also, you know, the environment plays a very important role in how, how people's intelligence turns out in terms of these test scores. Um, and... Um, So, you know, there is a lot of value in actually studying these genes because you can actually pinpoint, you know, there there are several hundred genes that have turned up in these studies. 
um, and they all, or many of them, uh, encode uh, proteins that our that our brains make. So there's something interesting going on there. But it would be a mistake to say, oh, I can just look at this list of genes and figure out, you know, is my child going to, uh, you know, get a PhD or not? I mean, you just cannot. It's so impossible to make those sorts of of, of predictions. And you know, if if you want your kid to do well, you know, there are things that we already know what to do, and they don't involve doing genetic tests or tinkering with their DNA. You write a little bit about um, some may uh, question why scientists continue to uh, want to study the link between um, our many genes and how it can influence intelligence. But if we were to know more, it might help with how uh, we choose to educate our children and and make sure that they are able to avoid certain environments that can impede the learning. Right. So uh, there are lots of... um, interventions that uh, education experts are thinking up and you know they, they want to figure out like how how can we improve the performance of students um, and you know you can look at these these questions scientifically you can run an experiment but in order to run an experiment you know you need to basically give some kids a particular program and have a control group that doesn't you know those sorts of basic th- ways of doing an experiment um, knowing about uh, the genes that these kids have, actually, you know, even if it only accounts for a little tiny bit of the variation and how they how they do, can actually make those studies much more powerful. Um, you know, because you don't want to like get you don't want to get fooled by results. Like if it you don't want to say like oh this this treatment works and it just so happens that you have a bunch of kids who just by random chance would have done really well regardless of what you did. Um, you want to find the things that really work. And so it's possible that, that getting to know these genes better could help those experiments. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is Carl Zimmer, an award-winning New York Times columnist. His new book is called She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. I believe we have an excerpt of the book on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. After the break, we're going to continue our conversation, and we're going to take some of your questions, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Have you taken genetic tests? What have they helped you learn about your relatives? What questions have these tests left unanswered? We're going to to find out more after the break. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about heredity today and learning that it means more than just the passing of genes from one generation to the next. My guest today is Carl Zimmer, who's written more than a dozen books. His latest is She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. Now, have you done ancestry testing? Did you learn anything surprising? You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, now, Carl, um, while we're reading your book, uh, you, you talk about how uh, you actually got your full genome sequenced. How did that opportunity arise? Um, it, it kind of by surprise. Um, a geneticist I had interviewed in the past said he was organizing a meeting a- about genome research and a DNA sequencing company was offering to sequence people's entire genomes um, for uh, two, about $2,000 and they would also like look at it to clinical geneticists to let you to look at it for you know medical conditions. And you know, as a journalist, I was amazed because, like, when I started writing about DNA in the 1990s, like, you know, at someone saying, like, would you like your genome sequence? I was saying, would you like to go to Jupiter? Like, <laughs> no, no I, this this can't happen. And here we are. It was happening. So I talked to an editor at STAT where I write sometimes, and uh, uh, they said, Let, let's turn this into uh, some some articles. And some of that ended up in the book. And, and so what I did was to, to get... Um, my whole genome sequence, which is a little different than, say, going to Ancestry or 23andMe, where what they do is they basically look at you know a fraction of 1% of your DNA to kind of get an overall survey. In my case, they were sequencing the whole thing, and I was actually able to get my hands on the raw data. A hard drive shows up on my, uh, my door one day. There it is. That's everything. Um, I have no idea how to make sense of it. <laughs> So I go to scientists like uh, here at Yale, uh, up in Boston and New York and so on and say, can you help me? And so it was a really exciting uh, journey of exploration to, to, to look at this massive amount of, this, of molecules that I inherited from, you know, 
millions of years of ancestors and and I could look at it down to the individual letters and start to learn what it means for me so what did they tell you um, you know it, you find out I mean fortunately um, I didn't have any you know big flashing red lights you know the genetics counselor who worked with me on this because I was I, I would I didn't want to start writing about things that might actually like be relevant to my children say mm -hmm. uh, before I really knew what, what I was dealing with um, I didn't have any of those serious conditions. Um, so instead, what I did was I would delve in and look at, you know, for example, uh, my Neanderthal genes. So, you know, people outside of Africa have about 1% to 2% ancestry of Neanderthals because humans interbred with Neanderthals mm -hmm. over 50,000 years ago, probably many times. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, 23andMe or these companies will say it will give you a percentage number, but, uh, you know, I really wanted to see the genes. And so it was very cool to see, like, hundreds of genes that passed down through thousands of years from some Neanderthal to me. And uh, and so, you know, but what's it's what's kind of mysterious is like when you look at what they do, mm -hmm. you know. Now some of them are involved in the immune system, and it's possible that um, those help living people because they 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 protect you against a wider range of diseases than before, possible. But then you get just weird genes, like um, one that is linked. I have a mutation in a Neanderthal gene that is linked to a, a, a slightly higher risk of nosebleeds. And I just keep puzzling over that because, first of all, I don't think I get a lot of nosebleeds. And second, like, what are Neanderthals getting nosebleeds for? You know, <laughs> there's just so many mysteries uh, about this. But it, what's really interesting is that w we might be watching this as the birth of a new kind of medicine, a sort of Neanderthal medicine, where we look at the genes that people have inherited from Neanderthals and other vanished humans that might be affecting our health. Well, when you uh, got all this data back, uh, were there certain things that you had known about from talking with your parents or grandparents that you were curious would show up in this whole uh, sequence that you got back? Or was it more of a discovery of things you'd never had even considered? Like, um, like the Neanderthal connection. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, uh, there, there are like little questions you have, like... Um, you know, like like you know, some members of my family uh, are lactose intolerant. You know, they just like they just they're just not very happy. You know, eating some ice cream or something like that and without some lactate. But so I could actually look down and be like, oh yeah, there it is. Oh, there it is. That I have that version of that gene that you know m makes it difficult for you to break down this milk sugar. You know, and but some people then have it because their their ancestors were cattle herders. And having the ability to, to drink milk as an adult could have been a difference of life and death. So you can, like, really piece together history that way. But, you know, my family is also very into genealogy. And, um, you know, on my dad's side, he's uh, from Ashkenazi Jewish ancestors. That shows up in the, in the ancestry. Uh, but my mother's side, you know, I'd always assumed that she was sort of German and English and Irish. But there seems to be a lot of... Uh, so uh, Southern European in our background, and I, nobody, nobody can explain that to me yet. So. <laughs> We're going to have to work on that. <laughs> uh, many of us take these tests to, to figure out what regions our ancestors come from. But when we're looking at DNA and how uh, the science works in terms of a generation after generation of what you're inheriting, uh, what exactly um, are we getting from our ancestors? What is the connection uh, when we see that we might have a fourth cousin um, and living in another part of the world? How much of how many similarities do we really have with them? You know, I, I think... I I I really think that we need to be super careful about not about overinterpreting those results. You know, like just, just getting a test result that results that says like you're you know say eighteen percent Japanese does not give you some sort of mathematical insight into your identity. Uh, and for one thing, if you go to several different companies, you'll probably get different percentages. These are incredibly rough approximations because um, scientists are just really beginning to get a handle on human genetic diversity around the world. And there are big parts of the world where the databases are just really almost empty. And, um, and you know, the fact is that if you go back, uh, you know, in your ancestry, um, you don't have to go back very far and you'll encounter ancestors that, from whom you inherit no DNA at all. It's just the way that DNA gets passed down from generation to generation. You know, each parent only passes down one copy of a given gene to their to their own descendants. 
So, like, if you go back 10 generations, maybe roughly half of those ancestors in that generation have no genetic connection to you at all. They're still your ancestors, but, you know, we need to think beyond DNA, think about more than DNA when we're thinking about ancestry and, and heredity. And you write in your book that was why you were reluctant to reach out to like a relative, I believe, that you had in Israel? Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, th- one of the things that you can do with these tests, which is a really um, powerful tool, is that you can look for uh, re- close relatives because um, as DNA gets passed down from one generation to the, gener- to the next, it, it gets a little shuffled. Uh, and so chromosomes trade pieces of DNA with each other. So what that means is that um, uh, people and their siblings will share lots and lots of very long segments of totally identical DNA. Your first cousins will have shorter segments of DNA in common with you and fewer of them, and then so on going further out to more distant relatives. So these these things really work. I mean, if somebody puts their DNA into these databases, um, you can find relatives. This is this is pretty powerful stuff. But, you know, to me, it's a little. I I, I, I had this list of people, including you know someone who had you know survived a, a concentration camp, and has, he was looking for his lost twin brother, and you know, and I'm thinking like, well, he might be related to me or not, and like, what do I say? Like, we we've had such different lives, and you know, the experiences we've had from our from our particular ancestors are so different that I don't know. I for me, I just it, it just doesn't work for me. Um, you know, some of my family like they they love it and they they reach out to these distant cousins and and make these connections. And you know, maybe for me, I'm overthinking it, but I just think like really like what connection do we actually have? Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's a fascinating situation that we're finding ourselves in now, thanks to this you know new science of heredity. Uh, in the studio with me in our New Haven studio here at, at WMPR at Gateway Community College is Carl Zimmer. His latest book is She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. As we find out what heredity really means, uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, we're hearing from a listener, Carl. Uh, Pete tweets, I wish I was near a radio and phone. I guess he must be listening to us via stream. My uh, ancestry DNA test found a nephew I still officially don't know about, ah, fun with family secrets. Sometimes you don't know what uh, you're going to uncover. Um, But there was also this really interesting uh, story that happened, uh, the Golden State Killer. This was a serial rapist murderer in the California area, and uh, police were able to find him because of a DNA match using one of these tests. Uh, That's really fascinating. What was your response when you heard about that? Uh, Yeah, I thought this was a really stark illustration of just how powerful these databases can be. Um, Again, they were taking advantage of this basic aspect of heredity, which is that close relatives will inherit the same long stretches of identical DNA. And so in this case, there's there's a kind of a a crowdsourced uh, site uh, called, uh, I believe it's called GEDmatch, um, where people just get upload their their data that they might get from a place like 23andme and together they sort of uh, compare their DNA and put in genealogical information to because they want to like find more of their relatives so it's just a it's a community of like-minded people um, and so police actually you know had DNA from what they thought was you know this 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 serial murderer and um, basically like uploaded it into the system, you know, not saying like, hey, everybody, we have this criminal. We want to compare him to you. (laughs) They didn't say that. Mm -hmm. Nobody realized what was happening. But they found that a few matches of relatives and then they worked out this very extensive family tree based on that and then worked their way back down to say, okay, who who in this extended family is a possible suspect? And that helped to narrow it down to this this one person. And then when they actually swabbed some DNA, I believe, off uh, a door handle and so on from this from the suspect, it matched. Um, so on the one hand, it's an amazing story of the power of this. But on the other hand, you know, there, uh, none of these people sort of signed on to this, you know. And, um, and if you think about it, it raises lots of fundamental questions about privacy and, do, you know, uh, the, the Fourth Amendment, you know, is this a reasonable uh, kind of search? You know, if if your cousin decides to upload her DNA to one of these sites, in effect, she is uploading some of your DNA. 
because you have identical stretches of DNA. Now, did you consent to that? No. Um, if, if, if she's okay with the police looking at her DNA, are you okay with that? Well, nobody asked you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so there actually are a, a, a lot of uh, legal scholars who are trying to work out, like, how do we deal with this new situation where there is a value to this kind of forensic science, but on the other hand, we have to protect our, our genetic privacy. Uh, and we, I mentioned earlier that you got your whole genome sequenced, and were you, you you gave that data up to science, right? I did, yeah. <laughs> what questions did you have, or did your family, uh, were they a little bit nervous about this idea of this information being um, shared so widely? Yeah, so, so the first big question was, do I get my genome sequenced at all? And then the second question was, um, what do I do if I find out something particularly medically worrisome? And then the, the next question came up when all these scientists did this research, and some of them said, like, this is so exciting. Like, we, you know, we, we can't just, like, dump all this data now that you've been writing about it. Let's save it. And so, actually, a scientist at Yale said, like, here's what I suggest. You just put your genome on my website, and we're going to put all the data that we've gathered there and we're going to use this as a teaching tool and um you know i thought about it and you know i personally decided i was okay with that you know and that was me making my decision you know i had the autonomy there like so i i think that people need the right to say no you 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 cannot have access to this it's 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 information about me but you know for me it's been a really interesting experience because now this this uh professor mark gerstein every year now this is the second year now, he is basically like making my genome one of the assignments in his class. Like, go look at Carl's genome and see if you can find something interesting in there. Um, And so I I show up in the class and watch the presentations and get a little freaked out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Before we head to break, Carl, uh, when we were talking about what genetics has uh, taught us and what scientists have learned, um, oftentimes it changes our perceptions of what we have been taught about race. And you get into that uh, in your book, this idea that race really is a social construct because biologically um, we are all similar as human beings, even though we may have different uh, characteristics uh, by the way we look. Can you go into a little bit about um, how genetics, what it teaches us about that connection. Yeah, so so I, I, I go back to the early roots of, of uh, the modern concept of race and, and racism, which really gets started in the 1500s and the 1600s, not based on any science, but, you know, based on essentially sort of an economic need to justify things like slavery or colonialism. I mean, that's there's there's really no coincidence that that's how uh, race and racism gets gets off the ground, and these are very powerful, enduring ways of thinking of thinking of groups of people uh, as being f- profoundly, fundamentally different. Um, you know, even, even in the 1800s, you know, people were claiming that races actually arose totally independently from primate ancestors; that we were not really even of the same species. Um, and once scientists could look at DNA, they could, they just found very quickly that that um, our DNA does not match any of these these old fashioned ideas um, about biological race. Um, you know, we there's just a huge amount of genetic diversity within any kind of arbitrary group that you draw, um, and uh, and it's very hard to find. You know, it, it, basically, it's impossible to find any sort of pure "Quote unquote race," uh, and you know, and what you find when you look back at the history of different populations is that they're the result of mixtures. So you'd have groups of people who kind of get separated for thousands of years, and then they would come back together and mix together. And you have these, and so you have incredibly genetically distinct people coming together, mixing together. Thousands of years go by, another mixture, another mixture. So we, you know, the scientists I talk to say, like, look. Talking about race in genetics is like doing uh, physics with the four elements of the Greeks, like air, earth, fire, and water. Like, don't make us go back there. Like, we want to move the science forward. Now, when we look at where people uh, come from, certain regions, uh, there are certain traits within us that might make us more susceptible to a particular disease, um, like a sickle cell or a Tay-Sachs. So um, it's interesting. Uh, for people to think about, uh, again, how when we look at race as just as a classification of how we look, there are maybe some, maybe we should be learning, learn, learning more about those traits that might make it more, that we're more susceptible uh, to certain diseases. And how do we talk about that then? To say that sickle cell um, 
only pre- predominantly affects mostly African Americans and Hispanics versus someone who's Caucasian? Well, these are just very. Th- th- when we talk in those terms, that's like a very rough approximation of reality, you know. And and it the 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 reality is really much more interesting. So you mentioned sickle cell anemia. Um, you know. It's actually scientists are are starting to like get an idea about where exactly that mutation started. You know, it's it may have started a few thousand years uh, in in Africa, um, and then it was passed down through generations, um, uh, and it actually spread quite far because it gave protection to malaria. Um, but it's not as if um, this mutation spread through you know the area where one quote unquote race lived. It's not like this is a mutation only for black people. Like it just went everywhere that nearby where malaria was a problem. Um, So it did not go in Africa very far south. So there are Africans who don't have the mutation because like malaria isn't a problem for them. And on the other hand, it it shot into the Near East and shot into Italy, where malaria has been, you know, tr- historically a big problem. So, you know, it, the history of that mutation is fascinating. But you know, if you're going to say like, oh, this is a, this is a black disease, you're you're totally uh, missing the full, the full history there. And before we head to break, Carl, a chip on Twitter wants to know what's the best DNA test site in Carl's opinion. Um, <laughs> and he writes of rumors of misuse. So, um, well, you know, in terms of misuse, I mean, I, I, you know, I, uh, I, I don't. I, I, some people are concerned. I, I would say uh, I have seen about uh, the use of this data for um, different kinds of research. People are concerned that their data is going to be quote unquote sold off. Um, and you know, you should, you should, un- you should find, do some research and find out, well, what, do, what does this company do with your data? You're totally entitled to know that. And um, uh, if you don't feel comfortable with a drug company coming and getting access to, to the data, then don't use that company. But on the other hand, you know, I, I will say that like, uh, the only way that we're going to f- make progress on a lot of understanding a lot of diseases with a genetic basis is for there to be a lot of data pooled together one way or another uh, so that we can f- identify individual genes that are linked to diseases. And companies like 23andMe are, are actually publishing important research um, identifying these genes because now they have hundreds of thousands or millions of people who have consented for their DNA to be looked at. So, you know, I would just say, like, do your research, get to know what these companies are doing, decide if you uh, approve of that or not. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Carl Zimmer is in our New Haven studio today. He's an award-winning New York Times columnist, author of more than a dozen books, including the most recent. She has her mother's laugh, the powers, perversions, and potential of heredity. Coming up, we know there's important information in our DNA, but what scientific advances may help prevent the kinds of diseases or traits we pass down to future generations? And what ethical questions do these advances raise? We're going to find out about that after the break. And you can join us, too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today, Carl Zimmer is in studio with us. He's the author of the book, She Has Her Mother's Laugh, The Powers, Perversions, and Potential of Heredity. We've been talking about what heredity really means. And uh, we don't want to let the hour go by, Carl, without talking about advances uh, because of what we know about genes today, including gene editing. Uh, tell us about um, what um, advances scientists have figured out just in the last few years related to um, how we might be able to cut out some bad parts of genes that make us sick. Right. So, you know, we we inherit genes, uh, some of which may uh, directly cause really bad diseases like Huntington's disease or sickle cell anemia. Some may give us a very high risk of developing cancer. Uh, and so, uh, you know, until now, you know, the, the treatment for hereditary diseases has included things like, well, um, maybe changing people's diet. That can actually save people from a devastating brain damage. I talk about one case called PKU in the book. More recently, um, people have said, well, as we understand these genes, maybe we can intervene on the genetic level. Um, And so there was a, a, for a number of years, there's been attempts to actually insert working copies of genes into cells to treat blindness or hemophilia. That's called gene therapy. And that's actually finally, after some decades, starting to really uh, get 
towards uh, clinical uh, application. But the really uh, wild uh, possibility that's emerged just in the past few years where we go into sort of science fiction territory is rewriting DNA. Just going in and just saying, mm, let's change those genetic letters a little bit and basically undo this mutation. Um, and so there are go probably clinical trials very soon using this technology called CRISPR. They're going to start maybe this year for things like sickle cell anemia. Mm -hmm. um, and it raises a big, po a big question. You could do this, say, on a, on a, on a human embryo when it's just a, you know, just a dozen cells. CRISPR those those cells that per, if a person who develops from that embryo would just not have the mutation in any cell and would then pass down their edited genes to future generations. You know, that could we could potentially do that, uh, and now the big question is: Should we? Mm. Uh, when we talk about uh, what we're able to screen for in terms of genetic uh, diseases, uh, when uh, people opt for in vitro fertilization, uh, they can uh, figure out if there's something, a trait that they don't want to uh, pass on uh, to their uh, future baby. Um, that is not as, uh, that doesn't raise a lot of uh, uh, questions today as it did when it was first, uh, when it first started. Well, you know, <clears throat> in vitro fertilization itself was incredibly controversial when it first began. Like, what right do we have to intervene and actually, like, you know, pick out an individual egg and a sperm and put them together? Like, that's not our place in nature. You know, now in vitro fertilization is, is incredibly commonplace. Um, it, 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 and uh, what some people are doing is, is saying, like, well, I have a particular genetic disorder. I don't want my child to have it. So can we test these embryos to make sh and only use the ones that do not carry that mutation. And so the, for the past few years, uh, these clinics m uh, will sometimes look for, say, one gene, you know, like I have Huntington's disease. I don't want my kid to have Huntington's disease. Um, but now, right now, scientists are going the next step and saying, we can sequence a whole genome from this embryo. Mm -hmm. And so we can say like, oh, you know, we can give you a score for all the genes involved in some trait, like risk of Alzheimer's or risk of cancer, um, height. Mm. And that's more controversial, the idea. And intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, like what do you, I mean, I just talked about how, how squishy and controversial the study of intelligence is, but like, you know, if you find these genes that are associated with intelligence and you get a score, do you pick the high scoring embryo? Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, this this will be able to to happen in the, within the next few years, and so we have to decide. Like, is that okay? Um, you know, I, I don't think anybody would want a kid to to grow up with Huntington's disease, but do parents have the right to make these more sort of uh, enhancing type choices? And that doesn't involve gene editing at all; just mm -hmm. selecting from the variation. Uh, you mentioned about um, what we have to decide. So are these conversations that uh, uh, bioethicists and doctors uh, are, and researchers are talking about today of how we decide what we can do with this, this technology as it continues to move forward? There is some discussion, and, and I think science, a lot of scientists are better, uh, more aware of these things than, than before. But um, uh, there needs to be a lot more conversation and, and more informed by history. Like, I think geneticists need to know about what was happening 100 years ago. It wasn't pretty, but there are a lot of lessons to be drawn from it for now. There's a lot in your book that we didn't get a chance to discuss. Um, what takeaway do you want uh, our listeners, when they pick up the book, as she has her mother's laugh, when they think about heredity and what we can learn from our past and how we also talk about our future offspring, what do you want them to know? Uh, I, I want them to know that heredity, uh, they Heredity is not what they think it is, and it's a lot more interesting and fascinating, even if we have a lot left to learn about it. Well, Carl Zimmer, it's been a pleasure talking with you today from our New Haven studio here at Gateway Community College. And I'm sorry that we ran out of time, but we appreciate uh, your perspective. And it is a really fascinating book. Again, she has her mother's laugh. Carl Zimmer, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Special thanks to Kion Wolf and Lydia Brown. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.